Hey class, don't forget that the first homework is due today, and aside from that, um, let's jump into the notes and uh, see how far we can get. Uh, I will post homework two uh, today, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, the, the cycle is never ending, <laughs> and um, it'll be due next Thursday. So, okay. Uh, all right, so we left off with recursive merge sort. Um, so uh, I want to emphasize coding uh, in this class. I want to make sure that we, we get around to it. Uh, so uh, the examples in Java, if you've never worked with Java, um, let's rip the Band-Aid off. Uh, so we need, uh, that's fine, we can start out like that. We need some new project, uh, Java with Ant. So Ant is a, an automated builder. Um, we want a Java application so that it'll execute. Uh, we know that we're writing uh, merge sort, so we want to name the project merge sort. Uh, and it says that it already exists. Um, I was pretty sure I cleared that. Oh, okay. It's last semester, spring. Okay, everything looks good. Let's create it. Uh, it takes a second. It does some scaffolding and creates some stuff automatically. Uh, and so I told you that if you can't get to Hello World, then typically that means you're in trouble. Uh, so let's see if we can get to Hello World. Uh, we're going to pass in a string, right? And then uh, we're going to execute it. Uh, and I just want to note that we are uh, using Apache's uh, NetBeans IDE. I'm using NetBeans 12. Um, if you're just getting started and you don't have a reason to use an older version, always use the latest uh, because these things become deprecated and cycle out of usage. Uh, so, okay, uh, now that we've made it that far, let's go back to, uh, to the PDF. And so we have the example, and you can see that it has the package name, it has... Uh, the coding example itself. So uh, we'll just uh, shrink this and uh, type out the code. And again, always type the code, never copy and paste when it can be avoided um, so that uh, you know what's actually going in. Uh, and also so that you're, you're drilling in the thoughts, so you start thinking in terms of uh, what you're programming. So there's uh, nothing more tragic than uh, finishing a program and having learned nothing and being unable to reproduce it. Uh, that would be a shame. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, we have our class merge sort. We have our package merge sort. All of that seems to be lining up nicely. Uh, let's clear this out. Uh, it would be nice if we documented it, but uh, <laughs> uh, right now it's just noise, right? Uh, okay, so uh, the main method is somewhere down here, right? Um, so we can initialize it if we want, um, or we can wait until we define the method. So these are going to break it whenever we're compiling. So if I have an example, I like to type out the methods first so that it's always in a state that will compile. Uh, and then we always get our little feedback here as well. Right. So type it out, private, static. Uh, and so if you're not familiar with the, all of the modifiers that go in uh, to a function declaration, a method declaration, uh, then uh, then let's go over it right now. Uh, so private is the access modifier. Uh, it says whether or not anything outside, any methods outside of this class will be able to access it. So C does not have the private, public, protected, final, uh, sealed, uh, whatever other uh, modifiers there are uh, that are present in uh, Java and C Sharp and C++. Uh, static is an indication of uh, whether or not you need an instance of the class in order to invoke the method. So in this case, uh, the class 
uh, has the main method and we're gonna invoke it directly out of main so either we would need to create an instance of merge sort if we didn't have this then we would need an instance of merge sort in order to invoke it okay. uh, but since we do have it then we can call it directly from main okay. uh, so So the point is that it's visible from here, whereas if we removed this, then it's no longer visible. Uh, so um, static, as I said, it just indicates whether or not you need an instance of the class in order to act on it. And then this right here is the same as a, a method or a function signature that you would see in C. It's, uh, and uh, not even every language provides the return type, right? Uh, but if you're operating in a language that has a return type, like uh, C or C++ or Java or C Sharp, uh, then uh, that's declared before the function name. The function name, every language is going to have the function names. Uh, and then uh, the, the input parameters uh, that are provided to the function whenever it's invoked. Uh, and so uh, in JavaScript, um, in Python, you won't declare the type. The types will be inferred. Uh, so in those languages, uh, you would just have some declaration that you're declaring a function. Uh, and in JavaScript, it's gotten extremely uh, fluid in how you declare that. And we'll, we'll review that throughout the semester. Um, but you would have the name, and then in those cases, uh, just the names of the variables. And then the type is inferred uh, by the runtime. Uh, okay, so uh, let's type it out now. So now that we know what all this gibberish is that we're doing. Uh, so uh, because these uh, this was embedded in the notes, I put this all in one line. Uh, it's better practice, though, to separate them out um, as a rule so that you can see <laughs> kind of everything that's going on. Uh, but, you know, it... Uh, it works either way. So if you prefer this style, if it is your style, and again, you should code enough to where you have opinions on stuff, uh, then that's fine, whatever works for you. Uh, and then uh, because we're doing sorting, uh, we construct, uh, and this isn't necessary, we'll take a look at an in-place version of merge sort, uh, but the way we're implementing it, uh, we create new uh, integer arrays uh, every time uh, the, the method is invoked. Uh, and then it's going to be the size of left and right combined because we're merging, right? We're joining two things together. Uh, okay, uh, and then the loop. Um, okay, uh, so I guess I should talk about uh, what it is that merge sort does and, and how it works and how it acts. Uh, before we get too far into this, that you understand what it is that we're trying to codify. Uh, and so the idea is that uh, if you uh, if you could guarantee that you were dealing with sorted arrays, then it's really easy to to merge them. So if it's already sorted when it comes to you, uh, then all you have to do is uh, kind of line everything up, single file, if you will. Uh, a left line and a right line. And then whoever's first in line uh, gets the comparison. Right? Uh, so if uh, you have a set of numbers on your left and a set of numbers on your right, and you look at whoever's next in line, uh, and you say, okay, well, I'm sorting from least to greatest. So if the number on the left side in the left line is smaller than the number in the right line uh, at the front of the line, then I'm going to take that one. Uh, and so here, we're assigning to the kth position, right? So this is uh, the line marker, <laughs> the, the serial number for the numbers in this sorted left array. This is the index for the sorted right array. And then this is the index for the merged array, right? And so we're assigning to that kth position uh, after 
k iterations. Uh, and because the left one, the left value was smaller than the right value, we, whenever we're merging the two separate uh, collections, the two lines into a single line of sorted order, right, because we're past a sorted input, then uh, if the left one, the one at the front of the left line is smaller than the one at the front, front of the right line, we pull from there and we stick it into the, the next place in line. Uh, and then uh, these incrementers uh, just say, okay, well after you assign to that position, I want you to add one to every value that has this plus plus once you're done with that work. Uh, if we were to do it the other direction, okay, it would say I want you to increase k by 1 before uh, you perform that operation. But uh, it's more intuitive to have it after. So I, I always use it as a suffix rather than a prefix. Uh, okay, so we say, okay, well if the left one wasn't smaller than the right one, uh, then we're going to take from the right line. You say, okay, well, what if they were equal? Well, then we're going to take from the right line. <laughs> uh, if they're equal, it doesn't necessarily matter which one we took from, right? Because we're looking at values rather than um, uh, than anything else. Uh, now, if we were sorting on something other than integers, if we were sorting on something that had some fallback, so um, like if we were sorting names, uh, and then we check last name. So if the last name comes before this one, uh, then we pull from there. And if it doesn't, then we check to see, okay, well, uh, was it a, a tie, right? Uh, did the other one actually come first? And if it didn't, then it was a tie. And in case of a tie, then you go to first name. And in case of another tie, you go to middle name. And in case of another tie, you go to birth date. In case of another tie, you go to social security number, right? And so this chain of comparisons, uh, it carries on much further, right? Uh, but the logic of the merge operation of tell me which one comes first from these two sorted uh, inputs, uh, that doesn't change. Right? Uh, and so the more flexible version of this will actually take in a comparison function. And rather than put in all of this, uh, It'll take some complex object here and, and an array of complex objects here, and it'll pass them to the comparison function, uh, and then it'll just take the output of that, whether, whether left or right came first. Um, okay, but since we're doing this all ourselves, you get to see uh, under the hood. Uh, okay, so either we, so we go through until we've exhausted one of our two collections, right? Either the left ran out first uh, or the right one ran out first. Uh, okay, uh, so the next thing we do is we pick up the unclaimed items. So again, we had them line up single file in, in two separate lines, uh, but in the order that they appear, right? So we're ordering from least to greatest. So we were given a collection that was already arranged from least to greatest, and then we were given a collection that was arranged from least to greatest. And then we're just zipping them together. We're saying, okay, well, if I always know that the next value is going to be the next one from your line, then I can just perform these series of, care, of comparisons and then stick them in in the order that I find them, right? Uh, and then once of the one of the lists is exhausted, uh, then I'll just add all the others to the end, right? Uh, but we don't know which one ran out first, right? So we perform this check. So uh, it while there's still something left in the left uh, array, integer array, then I want to do the same thing, right? But I don't need to compare because I already know that if I'm in this loop, then the right array has been exhausted. Uh, so now I'm just uh, doing the bookkeeping. I'm picking up whatever was left so that I make sure everything gets used once. Okay. So these two arrays, uh, they don't do anything different, right? We don't reset the value of i or j or k. Uh, we just really uh, want to complete the, un the work that was left uh, incomplete by the original while loop. So this handled the case while there was items in both arrays. And then 
one of them had to run out first and so this handles the case of whichever one had items remaining uh, they get stuck into the merged array and so now merged is uh, the amalgamation of these two arrays but in sorted order so sorted input left led uh, joined two smaller sorted in arrays into one larger sorted arrays and that's the purpose of the merge function okay. uh, and so now that that's done we can return merged uh, okay so how do we guarantee that we get these sorted arrays well I'm, I'm glad you asked <laughs> so that's the point of the next method right so again private static return type of int array uh, and now we're going to define our merge sort method uh, and this one is uh, even easier than the other one right? because there's not a lot of logic to be dealt with here so in this case uh, we have our halting condition so it's going to be a recursive function uh, and we say okay well if there's just a single item in the array then it's sorted uh, and, and in that case then we return uh, just that single item array. So it is an array, right? <laughs> but if there's only the one item, then we return it. Uh, okay. So when that's not the case, uh, then we can define a midpoint, and it's uh, going to be the length minus one divided by two. Right? And we're declaring it an integer, so it's going to round down. Uh, okay. So then uh, we're going to define left and right integer arrays, and you'll see you know, that naming convention matches over here. Right? Uh, and so uh, the left one has uh, midpoint plus one items, and the right one has all of the rest of the items. So items.length minus midpoint plus one or left dot length right either way uh, okay so now we need a loop and we're going to copy items into these arrays that we've just taken so we have this unsorted array in this unsorted collection now uh, and uh, we're going to put them into left and right unsorted arrays and, and you'll see where the magic happens and uh, it's it's very subtle right uh, but essentially we're just going to keep breaking up these arrays into smaller and smaller collections until they're just single items right so once it's just a single item well it's sorted <laughs> and we already have this thing to deal with two separate arrays that are sorted and returns a sorted larger array a sorted array with all of those values stitched together or zipped together into a single sorted collection. So then merge sort, all it does is break it down until you have this, uh, until you're only dealing with uh, singletons, these single item arrays, and then it passes them to merge and then this one builds it up. So this one tears it down and this one builds it up. Uh, okay, so let's finish the work. Uh, so we're looping. And so before we hit the midpoint, uh, and then even once we hit the midpoint, because it's midpoint plus one, uh, we assign to the left array. Uh, and then after we hit the midpoint, we assign to the right array. Right, so there's not a lot of logic here. We're just counting, so we say. Uh, half of the items go to the left, half of them go to the right. Uh, and then once I've broken it up, I return the result of uh, merge, right? So I'm merging them, but I'm merging uh, sorted arrays. And the way that I guarantee that is by calling merge sort on these arrays. Right? So at this point, it's unsorted. At this point, it's unsorted. At this point, it's unsorted. At this point, it's unsorted, but this keeps going. The call stack keeps building up, and it keeps going deeper and deeper 
until at first you start with a collection of uh, 128 items and then you split it up into 64 and 64 and then you have on the left you have a collection of 64 items and you split it up into 32 and 32 and you haven't returned anything yet you still you're still going deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole so then you have a collection of 32 items and you split it up into 16 and 16 and then you have a collection of 16 items and you split it up into 8 and 8 and then from 8 to 4 and 4 and then from 4 into uh, from 4 into 2 and 2 and then from 2 into 1 and 1. Well, you come in here and you have a collection of length 1, you just return it, right? So we finally returned on this branch, okay? So then finally we get to this second execution, and at that lowest level, the one that finally returned this sorted, I, this sorted collection of a single item, okay? uh, we finally call this one, and it's of length 1. It comes in here, it also has length 1, so it gets returned. And so finally, after our you know, login steps, um, we finally pass something to merge. And so it has a collection of size 1 and size 1, and then it stitches them together. It says, okay, well, I'll grab the whichever one comes first and stick it in here, and then it exits this loop. And it says, okay, well, one of you had something left over, so let me uh, append that to the collection. And then it returns. And so then this returns. Uh, and then it returns over here, right? That was the left branch of some deep call stack. So now we have this sorted array of two items, and we finally go to the right. And we have two items. And those two items get split up into one and one. And then finally it starts cleaning itself up at that point. And so when you're going deeper, you're splitting it up until you get a single item. But once you have a single item, it's sorted. It's magically sorted. So without ever performing a comparison, you're able to split it up into a collection of, of, of arrays, which are all individually sorted and by happenstance because they're the only item in their arrays. But you're then able to take advantage of this, which if given two sorted arrays, it zips them together into a single larger sorted array. Uh, and so it seems like a lot of work, but it's extremely clever and it's essentially as fast as you can get in terms of uh, sorting operations. Uh, and it, uh, it, it does it in this extremely clever manner. Uh, okay, so it is possible to do it without recursion. You can uh, do it in place, I think. Uh, or sorry, without copying the arrays. Um, you can probably do it without the recursive function calls as well, but uh, that would be some uh, difficult code to read. <laughs> and again, we're, we're striving for maintainability. That is the, the call of our profession. Uh, okay, so we have these two functions. Now we can implement main. Uh, okay, so let's make sure we pass in something that is unsorted. We don't strictly have to do this, but I want to print it out so we can see what we're dealing with here. Uh, and as we saw when we were dealing with C, printf is formatted printing, percent %d indicates a decimal digit, and then a space, and then we just have it fill that with the first parameter following the input string. Right? So it's just going to take the next item in the array. Uh, okay. Uh, and then we want a new line character once we do that. Uh, and now uh, we're going to call merge sort and we want to receive back the sorted items collection. And because it's not in place, we're going to get an entirely new array. So this left, this one is left untouched. So we're going to get a new array. 
so we need a new variable to house it. Uh, and now this loop is just to print it out. Okay, and we should be able to execute this in just a second. So same logic, printf, uh, expecting a digit, a decimal digit. So that's our new line character. Uh, and then one is just our statement that it's completed. Now we execute. So what are the errors? Print F. Okay. Uh, okay. So this was the original value. So you can see that lines up with what we had up here. And then this is the sorted collection. Uh, and again, so this logic works regardless of the data type. Uh, so to make it more abstract, you would have this just be some generic collection, and then it returns a type of that generic collection, or it works with in-place uh, substitutions, right, where it's performing the swaps in place. Uh, and then it accepts some comparison method. So you can have as many tie breakers as necessary uh, to resolve uh, uh, whenever something appears to be equal. Uh, so you can continue to check, okay, well, uh, the names match, but is it really the same person? Is there some way that I can sort them in a consistent manner? Okay, uh, okay. so now, uh, hopefully by now, you've written your first Java application, or uh, maybe not your first. Um, okay, so this is the one that I was saying uh, is in place. So this one, this example was in C. Uh, you can use Rex Tester to verify it. Again, type it out. I won't make you... Uh, sit with me as we type it out. Uh, but you can see that the, the logic is the same. So we have a merge operation which takes, uh, so now because it's in place, it takes the array that it's working with, uh, and then there's a start, a mid, and an end. So this breaks up, uh, so where previously we had a left and a right, now we have from start to mid and from mid to end, uh, and they're all acting on the same collection and we're just replacing the values in place, right? Uh, so merge zips the sorted collections into a single sorted array, right? and merge sort breaks it down into individual collections. Uh, and so the logic is very similar, right? Uh, so we call them merge sort on the left, merge sort on the right, and then we merge the results, right? But it's the syntax is a little different because we're trying to save on memory. We're not creating new arrays each time. Uh, but I encourage you to type this out and get a feel for what's going on. Uh, but uh, let's uh, get on with the notes. Um, maybe if we have time later on. Uh, I don't know. We, we won't have time. Right? Uh, so we'll, we'll be doing a bunch of other coding examples, and we already did a, in, an example of merge sort. Uh, but I do encourage you to. Uh, to type out all of the programming examples. Um, I'm quite confident that I, I did them all last semester, and so uh, if there are any errors, they're, they're very minor. Um, but uh, let's uh, try and run through the notes so that, uh, so that we already know, uh, so that we can uh, get through these as quickly as possible and jump to hopefully more interesting topics during the semester, or equally interesting topics, but more of them. Right. Uh, okay, uh, so chapter six is counting. Uh, it sounds kind of dull, um, but uh, you know this is uh, this is how we quantify the problems that we're dealing with. So uh, you can't really uh, begin to solve problems of scale if you can't quantify what scale is, right? So so where are these problems occurring? Well, uh, it starts with these fundamental building blocks, right? So how, how do we count them? Okay, uh, so we begin with uh, the product rule. Uh, and so it says if there's n one, so if, if you have some number of ways to do 
uh, two tasks, and, and this is the number of ways you can do the first task, and this is the number of ways to do the second task. Uh, and then you have to do them both, uh, then the number of ways that you can combine those two is the number of ways to do the first times the number of ways uh, to do the second. Uh, and so this is, um, okay, yeah, so <laughs> if, if you were to count in your major, right, like if you were uh, doing a double major um, and you were looking at the, uh, the courses within your major, so you have some base curriculum that you have to satisfy in order to get a degree, uh, and you have uh, the optional courses from your first major and the optional courses from your second major. So then their product is um, the, the number, <laughs> well, uh, it, it's even more complex than that, but uh, you know, ostensibly <laughs> it's, uh, it's the number of courses uh, from that first major times the number of courses from that uh, second major. Uh, so that would be the number of, um, possibilities available to you but there there would be other restrictions so that's not necessarily the best example for this um, you know uh, this is more like if you were given two chores to do at home uh, and so uh, these are the number of indoor chores and this is the number of outdoor chores uh, and you had to do one of each then the number of uh, total combinations uh, would be uh, the the indoor options and the outdoor options multiplied together uh, so that you're picking from one of that paired set right? uh, okay uh, all right yeah so this is probably a better example so uh, a new company with just two employees Sanchez and Patel rents a floor of a building with 12 offices uh, so how many ways are there to assign different offices to just these two employees? Uh, and so the answer is that you let one of them go first. So let's say Sanchez, he drew uh, the, the longer straw, and so he had to go first. Right? Uh, and so he can choose from any one of the 12 available options. Uh, and then uh, Patel, because he went second and Sanchez had already claimed one of them, uh, only had 11 options available to him. Uh, so then, the the number of ways that those two offices or that those twelve offices can be assigned to those two individuals, or that those two individuals can choose assignment from those twelve offices, uh, is twelve times eleven. So there's 132 ways uh, to assign those two to an office. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, and so uh, I, I just have this observation that already we can see the beginnings of combinatorics, right? So, uh, you know, this is the formula for n choose k, which you'll see in terms of combinations. Uh, but um, this uh, this is uh, so this is the number of permutations. So if we had exactly twelve individuals for choosing from those twelve, then it would be twelve factorial. Um, and then this is just like a notational convenience that indicates the product rule that we're stopping the factorial, right, which defines all of those different combinations. We're stopping it early uh, and leaving uh, the last n minus k unobserved. Right. So here we had two individuals, so k was equal to 2. So it's 12 times 11. or if we want to put it in terms of something that looks very similar to combinatorics, uh, then it's 12 factorial divided by 10 factorial. Right? But in that case, it's just 12 times 11. Right? But uh, if there was a third employee, uh, then uh, the number of choices available to them would be 10, because those other two would have been assigned. Right? And so we see that in that case, it would be 12 factorial divided by 9 factorial or 12 times 11 times 10. Right? Uh, so, uh, so then what happens with the dividing by k factorial is if we don't care which of those three or which of those two in the original case uh, got which office, we just want to know which offices were taken. Well then we, defi uh, we divide by, uh, so we know that you know two of them were taken 
it's only divided by k factorial uh, to get rid of the uh, <laughs> the repetity of the fact that it's still the same two offices that were taken regardless of which one chose which office or in the case of three people it's still the same three offices being taken regardless of the fact that there are six permutations six ways to assign those same three offices to those individuals and then that's how we get the uh, in choose k notation or the the number of combinations is so originally it's the the product rule right we start with the product rule so how many different ways can we assign it and then if we don't care if order doesn't matter then we divide out all of the different orderings uh, and then we get the number of combinations so order matters order doesn't matter okay uh, okay so next is the sum rule so we already talked about the product rule now we're going to talk about the sum rule uh, so uh, if a task can be done in either in one ways uh, or in two ways uh, where none of the set uh, overlaps then there's n one plus n two ways to do the task right? uh, and so uh, the the example kind of explains it really well uh, so suppose that either a member of the mathematics faculty or a student who is a mathematics major is chosen as a representative to the university for to a university committee how many different choices are there for this represent representative if there are 37 members of the math faculty and 83 members or in 83 math, math majors and no one is both faculty and a student uh, okay so this is an or operation right so I'm choosing from this set or this set uh, and there's no overlap well then it's the same as you know you join the two sets right so 37 plus 83 and then you pick from one of those 120 available options right? uh, and so it's uh, it's something that you already understand, but we're just formalizing it uh, so that we can have some common vocabulary when we discuss these uh, problems in, in more complicated scenarios. So, okay, so the product rule is pretty familiar, but you can see that that's going to relate later to, um, to combinatorics and statistics. Uh, and then uh, the sum rule uh, is a extremely simple, right? It's, again, intuitive and something that you could have figured out. But what about the case when there is overlap? So we said that there was no overlap here. Uh, what about when there is overlap? Uh, okay, so we're already discussing sets and unions of sets in this case. And so this would be the case where the sets were disjoint and then we were choosing from the union of two disjoint sets. Right? But in the case that the sets were not disjoint, uh, then we need to apply the subtraction rule or the principle of inclusion and exclusion uh, as it will come up. Right, so if a task can be done in either of in one ways or in two ways, so the same setup as the sum rule, uh, then the number of ways to do the task is n1 plus n2 minus the number of ways to do the task that are common to the two different ways, right? So minus the intersection. So before we were dealing with disjoint sets, now we're dealing with uh, sets whose intersection is not empty, so they aren't disjoint, and in uh, the example above, uh, that would mean that there was a faculty member who was also a student, perhaps a, a grad student or something. Right? Uh, so then in such a case, it's the same as before where you add the number of members in the two sets individually, but then you subtract the size of the intersection. Right? So uh, if there was uh, 37 faculty and 83 students and one person was both faculty and students, uh, then it's 37 plus 83 minus that one person. So then there's 119 unique individuals. Right? Uh, okay, so I'll leave you to think about that and <laughs> verify that it makes sense to you. Uh, okay, uh, so the example for uh, inclusion and exclusion or, or the subtraction rule. Uh, how many bit strings of length 8 either start with a one bit or end with the two bits zero zero right so we have some or operation here it's either this or this but they're not necessarily exclusive of each other so we can already envision that some uh, there are some bytes or eight bit strings uh, which 
uh, begin with a one and end with two zeros. There's nothing excluding that, right? So we have to perform that exclusion ourselves. We have to account for it in our advanced accounting, right? <laughs> okay, uh, so the either qualifier indicates that there are two classes of sets uh, which can satisfy the proposition in the above question, right? So set A is the one that satisfies this first property. Uh, and set B is the one that satisfies the second property, right, ending in double zero. Uh, so for set A, there's seven degrees of freedom, right? So we fix the first bit and the other seven can vary, right? Uh, so uh, seven degrees of freedom, each uh, with two possibilities, uh, then uh, it's gonna be two to the seven or 128 possibilities in that first set. Right. Uh, set B has six degrees of freedom, where we fixed the last two bits. Or bits right? uh, and again, each of those can be either zero or one, and there's six of them. So there's two to the six possibilities, which is 64. Uh, and then the intersection has five degrees of freedom. Right. So we fixed the first bit, or the most significant bit, and we've fixed the two least significant bits. So then these are up for grabs and they each have one of two possibilities either zero or one right? so there's 32 possibilities in the intersection set right? uh, okay so the difference rule the subtraction rule tells us that it's the sum it's the size of set a plus the size of set b minus the intersection of a and b okay? So we computed them directly. So the size of set A, when we only fixed one bit, uh, was 128. The size of set B, where we fixed two bits, was 64. And the size of the intersection, where we fixed three bits, the first and then the last two, was 32. Uh, and so just computing this, you get 160 ways to satisfy the proposition. Okay. And so this is the simplest case. We're gonna look at more uh, complicated examples of this whenever we do the principle of inclusion and exclusion uh, but this was the case whenever we deal with just two sets and then the principle of inclusion and exclusion uh, expands on that and we start doing things uh, you know all of these pairings or whatever and, uh, the notation gets more complicated but the idea is exactly the same as this foundational idea where we're doing this. So take a moment to think about it and then we'll deal with the more complicated case uh, pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, okay, so then the pigeonhole principle uh, is really simple. It applies to hash tables and arrays and um, the, uh, you know, tickets to uh, a football game or <laughs> whatever, right? Uh, and so it says, uh, if there is a K positive integer uh, so if, if, if k is some positive number, right, some positive integer, uh, and then you have k plus one or more objects to place into k boxes, then there's at least one box containing uh, two or more of the objects. Uh, okay, so <laughs> if we're going to use the football analogy, uh, imagine that we have uh, 100,000 seats in our football stadium, right? and we sold 100,001 tickets, right? and everyone that bought a ticket showed up. Well, there's only 100,000 seats, right? Uh, so one of those seats was double booked, right? And the same thing with airline seats as well. Right? If you sell more than there are slots to fit, then, then there are, uh, if you have more pigeons than you have holes to stuff the pigeons into, then one of them is gonna be double booked. Right? Uh, and so the way that that ap applies to uh, hash tables uh, is that uh, it means that you're going to have collisions. If you have more uh, objects that you're hashing than the number of slots to uh, hash it into, then you're going to have to start resolving collisions, um, which uh, can mean a performance hit, depending on how many collisions there are. Uh, okay, so uh, corollary to that, a function f uh, from a set with k plus one or more elements uh, to a set with k elements is not one-to-one. -one. Uh, right, so one-to-one -one is exactly what it means. Like if you were to line up everything on the left uh, with uh, 
of things that you're going to assign a value to. And then on the right, it's all of the possible values that you could assign something into. Uh, and the size of the set on the left is more than the size of the set on the right, then you can't possibly assign a unique value to everything on the left because there's not enough uh, there's there's not enough seats in the stadium for that to work out, uh, or there's not enough seats on the airplane for everyone to get their own seat, right? Uh, and so it's this very simple concept. It's something that um, uh, that we all understand intuitively, but uh, we don't necessarily think of it in the context of uh, computer science. So we take a moment to explicitly state that uh, that this is something that will come up, right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, buckets and so forth. This is the same thing as dictionaries and hash maps. Uh, and then it, it also applies to um, to both encryption and uh, encoding, information encoding and compression. Uh, and so, essentially, um, like you can ask, okay, well, how good of compression can I get? Uh, and then that's directly tied to the amount of information. So uh, you can compress information losslessly uh, by taking advantage of, uh, of of some of the fat that the information has to offer, right? So if you're encoding ASCII characters, well, um, the if you know that it's just text, right? So then you have 26 lowercase letters and 26 capital letters. So that's 52 values. Uh, but a byte is 256 values, and then you can think about you know punctuation and commas and new line characters and quotes and stuff like that. Uh, and so let's say that all takes up like another uh, you know uh, uh, let's say 48 characters. That's another 48 characters. Well, then you're still only using 100 of the 256 uh, values available to it. Uh, and so you could imagine a, a compression scheme where you just discard the other 156 or, or the other uh, essentially uh, three-fifths of the available uh, storage uh, and you you have this leaner uh, encoding, information encoding. Uh, well, you still can't go any further down than that because uh, you, you have to be able to restore it, right? Uh, and so uh, if you start, if you try and compress it more aggressively than that, right, than the minimum unique representations, uh, then you run into trouble because you can't, um, because of the pigeonhole principle. <laughs> so uh, there's only so many ways that you can uniquely map uh, something that has some amount of information that has to be represented down to something smaller. Uh, and so if you have more <laughs> more fat that you can trim or, or more uh, furniture to throw off the boat or whatever, uh, then you can do that, but you have to analyze those in one-offs. But in a, a generic algorithm, uh, there's only so much that you can trim and still be able to restore the data uh, you know, without losing some amount of information. Right? And it's because of the pigeonhole principle. Uh, so. Uh, it has to do with that unique mapping, that one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, and then we talk a little bit about uh, image compression and stuff like that. So go ahead and read it. It's uh, <laughs> well, I don't want to say it's interesting because I, I typed it out, right? But uh, you know, go ahead, go ahead and read it. Uh, it's worth thinking about uh, and then deciding on your own if it's interesting. Uh, okay. So then, uh, the generalized pigeonhole principle: if there are n objects. Uh, placed into K boxes, um, then there is at least one box containing at least n divided by K objects, right? So before we were saying if you have one more person in, in the stadium then you have seats or, or one more person on the plane then you have seats for, then someone is sitting in someone else's lap uh, or <laughs> someone is standing the whole time, right? Uh, well, uh, this says, okay, well, now if you have uh, two plus one, or, or uh, 2k plus one people on the plane, then uh, not only is uh, <laughs> is every seat double booked, but someone is triple booked, right? And so this says, well, you know, 
we're not guaranteed that there aren't some people in first class that get their own seat. But what we can guarantee is that at least one of those seats has, in the case of uh, 2K plus one people on a plane with K seats, then one of them has, you know, uh, in, in that case, a, at least three people on the same seat, right? Uh, so that's what this one is saying. Um, and that's how the ceiling function factors in. So we're just saying, like, not every seat, but one of them is at least this bad, right? Uh, okay. So then, uh, and the reason we don't claim anything further than that is, well, we could have it where uh, only one seat has more than one person on it, but uh, <laughs> that one seat has, you know, 250 people stacked on it or, or something like that, right? Uh, okay, uh, permutations and combinations. Uh, so uh, a permutation is a set of distinct objects in an uh, ordered arrangement, so order matters for a permutation. Uh, so uh, we're also interested in ordered arrangements of some of the elements of the set. So in the case where we were assigning offices uh, and we didn't use every office. Uh, so an ordered arrangement of R elements is called an R permutation. So those office assignments from the product rule earlier, that was an R permutation. Um, so it was 12, uh, R was 12 in that case and we were uh, permuting just two of the options, right? Uh, so then this is the general notation for that, and you'll see that this is exactly the product rule that we defined before. Uh, so now we have it as a theorem. So n is a positive integer, r is a positive integer that's less than n and greater than or equal to 1. And then uh, this, right, that product rule, um, is now given this notation. And we call it an r permutation. Uh, of a set with n distinct elements. So, sorry, I misspoke. So r would have been 2 before and n was 12 when we were assigning the offices. Uh, okay, so corollary to that, <laughs> uh, we now have it in that other notation that I'd mentioned, the one that looks almost like the uh, combinations one, except we're missing an r factorial, one over r factorial here. Uh, okay, so uh, this is just a, a notational convenience, uh, essentially. Okay, uh, so then the number of R combinations of a set with N elements where N is a non-negative integer and R is an integer, R between zero and N uh, is equal to this, right? So that's the distinction between combinations and we mentioned that this was extremely close to this, uh, but we divide out the number of orderings, right? So we've ceased to care about who got which office, we just wanna know which offices were picked, right? So then that's the number of combinations. Uh, okay, uh, and so we can note it as n choose r, and it has this value, n factorial over r factorial uh, times n minus r factorial, right? Okay, uh, so now we're on to uh, chapter seven, discrete probability. So we know how to count in an advanced manner now. Uh, okay, uh, <laughs> yeah, so this is the, the chapter for gamblers pretending to be mathematicians, excellent. Uh, okay, so <laughs> an uh, introduction to discrete probability. Uh, so uh, an experiment or a trial is a procedure that yields one of a given set of possible outcomes. The sample space of the experiment is the set of possible outcomes. Uh, okay, so we're, we're going to discuss this and we try and keep it in the context of computer science, but as we go through this, um, I want you to... Uh, to consider the case of, of biology, right? So uh, it was uh, Mendel, right? Gregor Mendel, uh, who um, is the, the father of genetics and uh, he did all of those experiments on the peas and, uh, you know, trying to identify uh, traits within the peas and heredity and stuff like that. Uh, and so uh, whenever we speak in these terms, right? So experiments and trials and sample space. Uh, I want you to think that these these terms they apply beyond the computer science and the math context. Like these can actually be experiments and trials, uh, and uh, and not everything has this fixed function. So you're you're counting in order to derive some function or some causal relationship. 
uh, but the the samples in such a scenario comes first, not the function, right? So you're not always given these well-defined uh, probabilities, and, and you don't always know everything in advance. But uh, it just shows that you can start on either end, right? So if you're dealing with some unknown, but you can repeat experiments over and over again, then you can derive probability. And then from there, you can... Uh, you can move in the other direction, right? So it is possible to start with a sample space. And in such a case, the sample space is actually, you know, a collection of samples, right? Uh, okay. So uh, if S is a, a finite, non-empty sample space uh, of equally likely outcomes, and E is an event that is a subset of S, and the probability of the event E is given by this, right? So the probability of E is uh, the number of events E divided by the total sample space. Uh, and so, uh, so let's say you're given uh, a, a die, right? Or, uh, yeah. So uh, there are six sides on the die, but it's not um, one through six. So, uh, you know, we I have a Clue, this game of Clue that I play with my kids. Uh, and so um, it's, uh, you know, actions on the die, and then some of the values are repeated. So you can move a character either two spaces or three spaces, uh, or uh, if you roll the white side, then you can look underneath the character to see whether or not they, they ate the cookie or whatever. Uh, and if you roll yellow, then you can look on, under a piece of furniture to find out if, um, uh, I forget what information the, the furniture I think it's like what was eaten in that room or something like that uh, okay so there's only one white white face of the die there's only one yellow face of the die uh, and then two sides of the die have um, the number three and then uh, one of the sides has the number four and one of the sides has the number two I believe right so then they're not counted equally, right? So most of them have a one over six possibility, right? But the number three, which is counted twice, has a two over six or one in three probability of showing up. Uh, so uh, each of the faces has an equally likely chance of uh, popping up, but the event in that case, uh, you know, is not necessarily uniform, right? So there's some multiplicity to one of the events. So that the probability of getting a three on that clue die uh, is uh, greater than any other po possible outcome. Okay. Uh, okay, so that's what we're reading there. Uh, and then we'll see that the all of the probabilities have to add up to one. Uh, okay, so uh, here's another example uh, where you're rolling uh, two dice. Um, and so uh, what are the odds that you get it to land on three? Uh, and so then you just count uh, each of the, the 36 possible outcomes and how many of them end up with a three. And there's only two. So the probability of a combined three uh, is one in 18. Uh, and you can look at that in more detail and you know, take your time with it if you want. Uh, okay, so we have uh, another theorem. So because everything has to add up to one, right, uh, and we're dealing with these probabilities where everything is has a probability of less than or equal to one, and one is the case that it happens 100% of the time. Uh, but in the case that it happens less than that, then we're dealing with this, right? So uh, either it happened or it didn't happen, right? <laughs> and if you add those two together, you get one, right? So every time we measured, something either happened or it didn't happen. Uh, so the probability of the event uh, E bar, or the complement of E, is equal to the size of the sample space minus the number of events where the thing happened. Right? Uh, okay. So you say, what if there's some third possibility, right? Well then, uh, that third possibility was that the thing you were measuring did not happen, right? <laughs> it's, it, it's pretty much covered that either something happened or anything else happened than the one thing you're measuring. Uh, and so, uh, in, in such a case, right, if it's uh, true, false, or maybe, right, well then true is right here, and maybe and false are everything else. Uh, okay. Uh, so then, 
uh, now we're, we have two separate events, right? So uh, maybe two of the faces of a die or whatever, or uh, you know, something else. Let E1 and E2 be events in the sample space S. Oh, okay, well, that wouldn't have been the case because uh, those are disjoint events. Then the probability of the union of E1 and E2 is equal to the probability of E1 plus the probability of E2 minus the probability of the intersection of E1 and E2. Uh, okay, and so this is just a, an application of the subtraction rule that we saw earlier, or which is a restriction of the principle of inclusion and exclusion. Uh, and it says that if you double counted something, you have to correct for it, right? So if these weren't completely separate to begin with, then uh, if you want to get this value from these individually, then you can count the size of this and the size of this, but you have to subtract off the ones that you double counted, right? And it's exactly the same thing we were looking at with the subtraction rule. Okay, uh, so now we have probability theory. Uh, when assigning probabilities to the set of samples S and S, two conditions must be met. Uh, the probability must reside in the range uh, 0 less than or equal to the probability of uh, S. Uh, so the probability of that event uh, is less than or equal to 1 for each S, and the sum of all of them adds up to 1. Uh, and you know that essentially follows from the definition. So S is your entire sample space. Uh, and then the probabilities are derived by counting the number of occurrences out of that entire sample space and dividing them by S. Uh, so, that, uh, so just from the definition of how we counted probability, right? the occurrences of an event out of all of the possible sets that we took a sample for. So those individual probabilities have to add up uh, to one. Right? Okay. Uh, so then uh, the first condition states that an event can never occur less than 0% of the time, nor can it occur greater than 100% of the time. Uh, and the second condition says that if you add up every possibility, the total must account for 100% of the outcomes. Right? Uh, okay, so now we're going to speak of a probability distribution. Right? So by definition, the function p that indicates the likelihood of each event xi in the sample space S is known as the probability distribution. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at an example. Uh, returning to uh, the role of a pair of dice, uh, we can define our discrete probability function as the probability of Xi, uh, where Xi uh, is in uh, maps, or is one of uh, the possible outcomes, 2 through 12, right? So. Uh, you can't roll less than a 1 on either one, and you can't roll greater than a 6. So that defines our domain, right? So this function maps one of these values, so one of the possible outcomes, to a probability. So each one has a probability. Well, how would we define such a, a nefarious function, probability function, P of xi? Uh, okay, let's take a look at it. Uh, so then uh, we could define this function for all integers, uh, but uh, because we know how uh, die work, we know that <laughs> there's six dies and there's one of six possible outcomes. So we can reduce it to just discuss the, the 11 possible outcomes when rolling two dice. Um, so uh, it's not possible to roll less than two or greater than 12. Uh, and then now we can count them individually. Uh, so if we were to do this by hand, then we would count the probability uh, or we know that the sum of all probabilities right, adds up to one, right? And so we begin by counting the probability that you rolled snake eyes, which is one out of 36, right? Uh, the probability that you rolled a three, and then we're adding up the outcomes individually. So we've labeled our, our uh, each die individually here. So there's die A and die B, right? Or if you had a, a red die and a blue die, right, then, uh, then uh, we could color them instead if you prefer, right? But uh, where we've assigned some label to each of them. Uh, so the only way to get two is if they're both one. The only ways to get three is if the first one is one and the second one is two, 
or if the first one is two and the second one is one, right? So counting them up, adding them up, we get the probability for this event. Similarly, for four, uh, one and three, two and two, or three and one, we get one twelfth. And so we could can carry on just by hand and adding them up, right? So it is possible to establish a probability for every one of them uh, just by counting and, and insisting that you get some outcome, right? Uh, and then we notice that the probability of 12 mirrors that of the probability of 2. And in fact, that symmetry holds throughout. So that the probability of 11 is the same as the probability of 3. Probability of 10 is the same as the probability of 4. Uh, so you can save some of your work. <laughs> um, but you do have to go through uh, the ceiling of half the values. Uh, OK. Uh, so then suppose that S is a set with n elements. And we have, uh, then we say that the uniform distribution assigns the probability of 1 over n uh, to each of the elements of S. OK, so we've been discussing uh, dice a lot. right? So that is a case uh, with a, a uniform distribution. So each side of the die has a 1 in 6 chance of popping up. And there's six possibilities, right? So that has a uniform distribution. Uh, the the outcome of a pair of dice does not have a uniform distribution, right? Uh, so uh, individually, if order mattered, it had its, a uniform distribution. But because we only care about the com the the combination, the uh, summation of those uh, to get the the outcome, then it doesn't have a uniform distribution, right? So there's that distinction where uh, you can go from something that does have a uniform distribution to something that doesn't, right? But it, it, uh, when we're discussing that, then if you have impossible outcomes in your set and each has the exactly same probability of coming up, then you have a uniform distribution, right? All things being equal. Uh, okay, so then the probability of an event E is the sum of the probabilities of the outcomes in E. That is, uh, the probability of our event is equal to the sum of the smaller probabilities, right? So the probability of an event is equal to the sum of the smaller probabilities, right? Where this and this, this and this, where we're counting them individually, right? Okay. So in the special case that E is an infinite set, then the sum of the probabilities of S, where S is in E, uh, it has to be a, a conversion series. Uh, otherwise, the condition the probabilities adds up to 100% of outcomes would be violated. OK. Uh, so that probably won't come up in our class. <laughs> OK, uh, so next theorem, uh, if we have event 1, event 2, and so forth, and they're each pairwise disjoint events in our sample space, uh, then the probability of the union is equal to the sum of the probabilities individually. And that's because we have no correction. The intersection is always empty. That's exactly what it means to be disjoint. Uh, so then we have this simple representation. Uh, OK, uh, so now let's discuss intersections. Right? So let uh, E and F be events where the probability of F is greater than 0, uh, so that we're not dividing by 0 then the conditional probability of E given F denoted by the probability of E given F is defined as uh, this. So this notation E given F is equal to the probability of both of them happening divided by the probability of F happening individually. Uh, and so that is by definition. Right? Uh, and so um, the you can manipulate this a little bit to see that uh, the probability of F times the probability of E given F um, is equal to the intersection of E and F. Um, right. Uh, okay. So you can manipulate it a little. You can think on it a little bit. Uh, see if we come up with an example later on for that. But, uh, okay. Uh, so then. Uh, the events, if the events E and F are independent, or by definition, they are independent if and only if the probability of their intersection is exactly equal 
to their individual probabilities, right? Uh, so then, um, okay. Okay. Uh, so then, uh, the events are pairwise. Well, here, let me. We're close enough to the end of class, and I want to make sure that we're getting something of value out of this. So um, let's go ahead and call it. Uh, I will post your homeworks, uh, so make sure you look for those today. And then um, don't forget to submit homework one. Uh, okay, uh, have a, a great weekend, and I will talk to you on Tuesday.